So it may be something after work if people are available to go over. Kind of depends on when their um, tour manager guy um, is ready to get them set up. But they are coming to the high school on December 15th. It's a free concert. The tickets are free. Uh, I am going to go pick up some tickets this week, but we do have a sign-up sheet up there if you want to let me know how many tickets to get for you. I was going to start off getting 25, but I also don't feel like that's enough. Um, but they're going to be doing... Christmas songs, songs off their Christmas album, and they're they're really talented. And um, Elevate Praise is bringing them to town for December, so that's going to be just a fun time to worship as a community rather than just as our individual church bodies. So I'm excited about that. Then other things coming up. I don't have a slide for them yet, but you'll see on Facebook there is um, Christmas caroling night. That's going to be December 20th. That is also the same night as the youth lock-in. So after we're done um, eating and caroling, then the adults are kicked out because the kids are going to be hanging out here for the night, playing games and doing who knows what kind of crazy shenanigans, marshmallows and whipped cream or all the other crazy games they did last time. Um, and then we do have a Christmas Eve service plan for the 24th at 7 p.m. So if you um, are able to come to that, that's again another time where, you know, there are some people that are on the fringe of believing, they kind of want to believe, but they don't really know how to engage in that. So that's another time where a personal invitation, inviting them to that service sometimes can get them uh, an opportunity to experience the presence of God, and that's what we're going for. Healing rooms are today after church, so also if you want to stay for that, is there a sign-up sheet for that too? Yeah, okay, same, same pad of paper. Sign up for healing rooms if you want to stay after for about 10 to 15 minutes of personal prayer. Um, we call them healing rooms. We were talking about this last night. If we should keep them with that name. It's not always praying for physical healing. So, I mean, if you do have a physical condition, we do want to pray for that. But it also can be on any level of your needs. So, if you're having challenges in your marriage or you're having challenges... Um, you know, sleeping at night, or you're having bad dreams, or you're having any of those things, um, or maybe you're just kind of in this season where you don't know what you're doing or where you're going, and so it's a chance also to get some prophetic encouragement for those um, things as well. I don't think there's anything else. Oh, the last thing. Shop with a biker. This is our last week to collect for that. We've collected, um, you know, a few hundred dollars. It takes two hundred dollars to sponsor sponsor each of the kids. Um, and so if you want to donate with that, you can put a separate um, check or thing in the offering when it comes around after service, or there is a mailbox on the wall back there. You can put your um, donation in there as well. And also I wanted to say on the Connect cards, if you have a need for this Christmas or know a family locally or even not so locally that has a need and maybe isn't going to be able to get there, um, Get anything for their children we want to be able to help so either we could connect them with shop with the bikers so that they can go uh, down to robinson with the bikers and get the 200 dollars um, of gifts 
or um, as a church family, we also are going to be able to support those. So definitely write that on your Connect card along with any other prayer requests and drop that in the offering later. And we will gladly make sure somebody steps up to the plate to help financially with that. And then my husband has a message for today. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Awesome. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> Just after I watched the dog shine on you, it was amazing. Sorry. Oh, well, about me, Jeter, so it was. Well, it was um, so, what is. Go ahead, Sam. What is. Uh, the parents favorite Christmas song. Anybody know? Your parents favorite Christmas song. Your parents. Any parent. Silent night. Isn't that classic? <laughs> yeah. You've been dying to tell that joke. I have been. I'm not a worst joke killer, too. I'm surprised I remembered it. Uh, so you probably think, what in the world is he wearing this for and all this stuff? Can you guys see me over here with this tamperness? Tim Norris? Okay. Thanks, Tim, for coming. And also, I'll probably get started. Um, we didn't really mention it last week. You mentioned the church meeting that great, but we didn't really thank the people who did it. The ladies' group is the one who really did it. I really want to thank them for stepping up because they spent a lot of hours here. And there's a bunch of them. They spent probably six hours or something right here. Decorating it don't look like a bunch, but it's it's a lot to me. So thank you guys for being here. Um, <laughs> he's available if you want to be So it was the summer in the early 80s. Yeah. Some of you probably don't remember that. And the babysitter took a group of us down to the local stop and shop to get some slushies. And uh this is when I became the Orleans Saints fan. And how I became this was from a gumball machine that had all these little miniature helmets in there. And we had every NFL team. And I remember looking at those helmets saying, man, that black and gold looks cool. And then I put my quarter in, and that's what I got, was that black and gold helmet. That's what I became to know as the New Orleans Saints. And at that time, I had no clue who the New Orleans Saints were. I knew they were a football team. But I had no idea they were a terrible football team. <laughs> I mean, the fans literally wore bags on their heads. And were famously called the Aints. <laughs> but I became a fan and started reading for the underdog. And every year, there was always that promise of hope. This is going to be our year. Hope to make the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. And the franchise began in 1966, but they didn't even make the playoffs until 1987. And that was our first winning season, too. So uh, Then they went to the playoffs again in 1991 when they won their division for the first time. Then for nine more years, they were back to a losing way, ways. All hope had faded, and the Aints were back. Bags were back on. Then in 2000, hope came back and a new coach. And that year, the Saints went to the playoffs and won their first ever playoff game. The following four years were filled with mediocre football at best, and it always seemed to start and never line just right. Some of you kind of can relate to that, like the Redskins fans and the Bears fans that one day. So let's pray the Browns, yeah. I don't pray for those people too. Um, so let's pray really quick. Lord, come and invade this place, open our hearts and our minds, and bless us in this Advent series to see what you want to do with us. Pray over this sermon that my words to use them to connect with other people to hear what you have for them. Jesus name for So it was August 29, 2005, and Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Now I will never forget seeing the flooding and the destruction that storm did. Hurricane Katrina claimed 1,833 lives damaged over one million homes in the Gulf Coast region and displaced over one million families. This happened during the football preseason, and the New Orleans Saints had to play the whole 2005 season on the road, because during the floods that followed Katrina, the Superdome went from 
a place of refuge, of last resort to a disaster area. The dome housed 30,000 evacuees, and there were overcrowded conditions for days without plumbing or power. And the dome was in, in major need of repair. Then, in 2006, hope began to arise. The Saints had a new coach, a new quarterback, and something that wasn't there before. They had this emotion and desperation and a gumption to take back what Katrina did to their city. They wanted their city back. They had something there. And I will never forget the New Orleans Saints' first home game after Hurricane Katrina. It had been nearly 21 months since the last time they played at their home, the Superdome. They started off the season with two games on the road, and won them both. The hope was building, the faith was rising. This coach and quarterback combo was a real deal. And the people of New Orleans and the Saints. The, this was a real deal, and to the people of New Orleans and the Saints, this wasn't just a football game. The last 21 months was building up to this moment. To start the game, the Atlanta Falcons, the division rival, received the ball. The crowd was crazy loud and the building was shaking, and the New Orleans defense stopped the Falcons. The Falcons had to pump the ball. Then Hope showed up. What happened next, I can never have enough words to explain the feelings it gave me. I was jumping up and down, cheering and crying, and I will never forget the sounds and the feelings from this one play and the rest of the game. So I have a video of this one play. What this did for yourself. I'm trying. Thank <laughs> you. 
God allowed them to eat of any fruit in the garden but one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was forbidden to them. They had a choice to obey or disobey, but God warned them that their death would result if they disobeyed. Meanwhile, a mighty angel named Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven, and he and one third of the angelic host were cast out of heaven. Lucifer came into the garden where the man and his wife were. There, he took the form of a serpent and tempted Eve to disobey God by eating the forbidden fruit. He told her that she would not die and that the fruit was actually good for her. She believed the lies and ate some of the fruit. She then gave the fruit to her husband, Adam, and he ate it too. Immediately, the couple knew they had done wrong. They felt ashamed and exposed, and God came looking for them, they hid. And of course, God found them, and he, judgment was handed out. The ground was cursed for man's sake, and he had to work the ground to produce fruit, basically. Um, the woman was cursed with pain during childbirth, and the serpent was cursed to call the dust from then on. And this is where the first promise comes in. And then God made a promise. One day, someone will be born of a woman who will do battle with the serpent. This one would be called, this one would crush the serpent's head, and although he would be injured in the process. God then slaughtered an animal and provided covering the skin for the simple couple, and he drove them out of Eden. The struggle between good and evil continued with the couple's family, and one of their sons, Cain, murdered his brother Abel, and the curse for his you know, curse for his uh, deed. Another child was born, and his name was Seth. Several generations later, the world was filled with wickedness. Violence and a disregard for God were rampant. God determined to destroy the wickedness of man and begin anew. A man named Noah, one of Seth's descendants, was extended grace. God revealed to Noah that he would send a great flood to destroy the earth, and he gave Noah instructions on building an ark to survive the flood. Noah built the ark, and when time came, God caused animals of each kind to enter the ark. These animals, along with Noah and his family, were spared. The flood destroyed every other living thing on earth. After the flood, and his family after the flood, Noah and his family began to repopulate the earth, when their descendants began building a monument to themselves in defiance of God. God confused their language. The inhabitants of the earth separated according to the language groups and spread out over the face of the earth. So now, this became a time for God to introduce the serpent crusher into the world. The first step was to create people set apart from himself. And he chose a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah to begin a new race of people. God called Abraham away from his home and led him to the land of Canaan. And God promised Abraham innumerable descendants who would possess Canaan as their own. Another promise. God also promised to bless Abraham's seed and through that seed to bless all the nations of the earth. The problem was that Abraham and Sarah were barren and old. But Abraham believed God's promise, and God reckoned Abraham's faith as righteousness. In due time, God blessed Abraham and Sarah with a son named Isaac. And God repeated his promise of many descendants and blessings to Isaac. Isaac had twins, Esau and Jacob, and God chose Jacob to inherit the promised blessing and changed his name to Israel. Jacob and Israel had 12 sons who became the head of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, same on there. Right halfway. This is all important, though. Once you understand all this, due to a severe famine, Jacob moved his entire family from Canaan to Egypt. Before he died, Jacob gave prophetic blessings to each of his sons. To Judah, he promised there would be a king among his descendants, one who would be honored by all nations of the world. Jacob's family increased in Egypt, and they remained there for the next 400 years. Then the king of Egypt, fearing that the children of Israel would become new, too numerous to handle, they enslaved them. God raised up a prophet named Moses from the tribe of Levi 
to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt and back to the land of which had been promised to Abraham. The exodus from Egypt was accompanied by many great miracles, including the parting of the Red Sea. And once safely out of Egypt, the children of Israel camped at Mount Sinai, where God gave Moses the law. The law was summarized up in Ten Commandments and was the basis of the covenant God had for Israel. And if they kept the commandments, they would be blessed, but if they broke the commandments, they would suffer curses. Israel agreed to follow the law of God. In addition to establishing a moral code, the law defined the role of the priest and prescribed offering of sacrifices atoned for sin. Atonement can only be made by the shedding of blood, of a spotless sacrifice. The law also detailed how to build the holy tabernacle or tent in which God's presence would dwell and he would meet with his people. After receiving the law, Moses led the Israelites to the border of the Promised Land. But the people, fearing Canaan's warlike inhabitants, and doubting God's promise, refused to enter. And as a punishment, God turned them back into the wilderness where they were forced to wander for 40 years. In his grace, God miraculously provided food and water for the entire multitude. And at the end of 40 years, Moses died. One of his last prophecies concerned the coming of another prophet who would be like Moses and to whom the people must listen. Moses' sex, sex bleh, Joshua came. <laughs> I can't speak. Was used by God to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And they went into God's promise that none of their enemies would be able to stand against them. God showed his power at Jericho, the first city they encountered, by causing the walls of the city to fall down. In his grace and mercy, God spared a bleeding harlot named Rahab from Jericho's destruction. Over the next years, Joshua and the Israelites succeeded in driving out most of the Canaanites, and the land was divided among the twelve tribes. However, the conquest of the land was incomplete. Through a lack of faith and civil disobedience, they failed to finish the job, and pockets of Canaanites remained. These pagan influences had an effect on the Israelites, who began to adopt the worship of idols in direct violation of God's law. After Joshua's death, the Israelites experienced a tumultuous time. The nation would laugh to the idolatry, and God would bring judgment in the form of enslavement to an enemy. The people of God would repent and call on the Lord for help. God would raise, and then raise up a judge to destroy the idols, rally the people, and defeat the enemy. Peace would last for a little while, but after, but after the death of the judge, the people would invariably fall back into idolatry and the cycle would repeat. The final judge was Samuel, who was also a prophet. During his time, Israel demanded a king to rule over them in order to be like the other nations. God granted their request, and Samuel anointed Saul as Israel's first king. Saul was a disappointment, however. He disobeyed God and was removed from power. God chose David of the tribe of Judah to succeed Saul as king. And God promised David that he would have a descendant who would reign on this world forever. You see, catch all these little promises in there. I know I'm going really fast, but they're in there, and I will bring them up to you later. David's son Solomon reigned in Jerusalem after David's death. And during the reign of Solomon's son, civil war broke out, and the kingdom was divided. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. The Davidic dynasty was in Judah. The king of Israel had a series of ungodly kings, and none of them sought the Lord or attempted to lead the nation according to God's law. God sent prophets to warn them, including the miracle working Elijah and Elisha. But the kings persisted in their wickedness, and finally God brought the Assyrian nation upon Israel in judgment. The Assyrians deported most of the Israelites, and that was the end of the northern kingdom. The kingdom of Judah had its share of wicked kings, but the chain was broken by an occasional godly king who truly loved the Lord and sought to govern according to the law. God was faithful to his promise and blessed the people when they followed his commandments. The nation was preserved through, during the Assyrian nation and endured many other threats. During this time, the prophet Isaiah 
preached against the sins of Judah and foresaw the Babylon invasion. Isaiah also predicted the coming of the servant of the Lord, who would suffer for the sins of his people and be glorified and sit on David's throne. The prophet Micah predicted that the promised one would be born in Bethlehem. Eventually, the nation of Judah also fell into gross idolatry. God brought the nation of Babylon against Judah in judgment. The prophet Jeremiah experienced the fall of Jerusalem and predicted the Jewish captives in Babylon would return to the promised land for 70 years. Jeremiah also prophesied a future covenant in which the law was not written on the tablets of stone but on the hearts of people, God's people. This new covenant would result in God's forgiveness of sin. The Babylon captivity lasted for seven years. The prophets Daniel and Ezekiel ministered during that time. Daniel predicted the rise and fall of many nations. He also predicted the coming of the Messiah, or the Chosen One, who would be killed for the sake of others. We're almost done. Right, praise the end. After Babylon fell to the Persians, the Jews were released to return to Judah. Many Jews returned home to build Jerusalem and the temple. Nehemiah and Ezra led those endeavors with encouragement from prophets Haggai and Zechariah. One of Zechariah's prophecies included the description of a future king who would come right in Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Not all the Jews returned to Judah, however. Many chose to stay in Persia, where God still watched over them. A Jewess named Esther rose to the rank of queen of Persia and was instrumental in saving the lives of all the Jews in the kingdom. Malachi, who wrote the last book of the Old Testament, he prophesied that the Lord would come to his temple, but before his arrival, another messenger would prepare the way for the Lord. This messenger would be like the prophet Elijah of old. And after Malachi's prophecy, it was another 400 years before God spoke directly to man. That is the Old Testament. It's pretty amazing. And you guys both sleep. All right. So we're going to pick up our story in the New Testament with the birth of Jesus and this man named Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, the light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sign for which will be spoken again. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So can you imagine how Simeon felt holding the Messiah in his arms? He was holding this hope of the world, the hope that took over 4,000 years to get here. And Simeon probably remembers his ancestors and his ancestors' brains talking about the day the Messiah would come, and they never got to see it. And here it is in his hands, this beautiful little baby who is going to change the world, who will fulfill the prophecies, who is the seed of Abraham, the serpent treasure. He's going to set the captives free, he's going to take away the sin of the world, and he's going to bring in a new covenant that will be written on our hearts. You can't imagine what's going to go up there. There are times in this life we will probably lose hope on things, kind of like waiting 108 years for the Cubs to win the World Series. And I would say a lot of Jewish people probably lost a lot of hope in waiting on the Messiah. But what really stuck out to me in seeing this story was the Holy Spirit revealed to him that hope will come to him before he died. Simeon didn't quit. 
He kept serving. He kept believing that this day would come. He kept running the race because he knew God would not let him down. You see, when God promises something, it will happen. It may not be when or how you think, or it may be when you're just about to give up. But what it really, what it's really all about is that thrill of hope. The thrill of thinking this might be the day your hope will be revealed. That thrill of the promise God has for you. In that moment when your hope is in your arms and you go from underdog to victor. You have a confidence or a peace in knowing with Jesus in your arms, you can defeat anything the enemy throws at you. God has promises for each and every one of you, and he made you to overcome. He has hope in you to partner with the Holy Spirit to seek promises for your life. He wants you to know if you partner with him, you can't lose. Because if he is for you, nothing can stand against you. So to end, I would like to encourage everyone to complete week one of the journal that's been handed out. This is going to be really impactful in your life. And it will help you step into what God has for you. He wants to bless you beyond imagination. So I'm asking you guys to go into your war room with this journal and ask God to help you with your hopes and his hopes for you. So let's pray and I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship, the worship team and where we are offering the Lord. Lord, um, thank you for what you've delivered here. I know there's a lot to take in. This all comes down to simple hope. The hope you have for us, the hope in you, the promises you have for us. Come and reveal them to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. heard a, a great message that reminds us of how important it is that we think about hope and how hope changes our life and how it makes a difference in our hearts. And uh, I was thinking about the offering while Johnny was preaching and uh, the scripture that came to my mind is uh, from John, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, 33. It says that we're to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all of these other things that we worry and fuss about all of our lives will be fulfilled in Christ. And I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, Christmas is kind of a busy season because we're caught up in shopping and doing all kinds of things. But scripture says we'll seek his kingdom first and his righteousness and all of these other things will be put in their place. So let's fire his to good place and let's ask God's blessing on our offering. Father, thank you for reminding us sometimes we get things all messed up in our minds about what's important. You tell us in your word that we're to seek your kingdom. That means that we're to come after you wholeheartedly without any reservation or any hesitation in our hearts that we want your kingdom, your purpose, to be in this world, to be revealed, and to be shared with those around us who don't know that and don't have a clue to understand what that really means. But because we're believers in Christ, you've taught us that seeking after your kingdom and your righteousness puts everything in their proper order. And Lord, we pray as we take up our tithes or offerings today that we have a grateful heart. Thank you for a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm sure many of us we're able to eat more than what we probably could ever imagine that we could eat. But yet, we thank you for that. It's, it's just a gift of what it means to be a part of the season of Thanksgiving. We pray here today that you help us to take what you've given to us and give back to you a measure of our faith and understanding of what it means to be a giver to us. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen.
Oh, yeah. 
Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never sleep nor slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. God, we thank you that our hope is it's not based on us, it's not based on our ability, it's based upon you. And that we do not have to ever, ever, ever live and feel hopeless. And so in this season of remembering you coming and stepping into the world, you not staying distant, you not staying detached, but you coming and bearing weaknesses and living everything that we experienced, dealing with family drama, dealing with weather and just life on earth in general, and conquered it all. So our hope was rested in you. Our hope is found in you. We have something, something to always look forward to and remember. So as we close out today, if there's something that God uh, wants you to stand in us in agreement with you, if you're feeling like I'm, I'm in a season where I don't have a lot of hope, or in a season where you are hoping for something in particular for someone else, if any of these words resonate with you that are on the screen, you see them like, yeah, that's, that means something to me, I invite you to come up, those that are prayer partners, you can come up and just be available to pray with people. There's the healing rooms afterwards as well, and the papers probably that I connect with. So we just invite you to come and be available, just to be able to, to seek out and say, Let's, we want to partner with you and help this week. So I thank you that we're not, we're not doing life alone. We get to come together every week. We get to celebrate you. We get to celebrate your goodness. We get to say, we're, we're joining with you in your kingdom what you're doing on the earth. We're joining in your kingdom what you're doing here in our towns. That we can have hope. We can look forward to the good things that are coming. We can look forward to what you're doing. That we have we have hope for the state of Illinois. Which is not a common thing these days. We'd say, no, God, this is this land is yours. It's part of your kingdom as well. Our towns are yours. They're part of your kingdom. Our families are yours. They're part of your kingdom. Our own. Our own hearts and our minds are yours. We've given ourselves over to your kingdom. If that, that doesn't resonate with you, if you, like I don't really know that I have, come on up and to pray with you with that as well. So we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this remembrance of what it means to look towards you, place our hope in you, to have that sense of chills and goosebumps and excitement that something's actually happened, it actually happened, something just changed. There's a shift that's happened in life. And that's only possible because of you and what you're doing. So we look forward to this week, we look forward to walking it out through the hope that you've given us, Jesus. Amen.